All right, I think we're ready to start. Um, so that was that was exciting. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm, I want to talk to you guys today about uh, bringing non-coders into the free software community. Um, and uh, I want to start with a disclaimer that people don't necessarily fit in a tiny box. It's like, so some people code a little or a lot, and they might be designers slash coders, and, and that's great. I'm not, I'm not advocating for like a, a hard line between people that code and people that don't. Um, but uh, people do gravitate towards certain activities, and when they do activities that either they don't want to do or that um, they don't feel like they have time to do, it doesn't work out so well. Like context switching is really time wasty. Maybe you have plenty of code to write at your project and don't really want to learn how to do graphic design, and that is totally fine. Um, so it's you see this a lot where uh, projects are like, well, no one else is doing it. No one else is maintaining the website, and then you get these websites where it's like just a tiny bit of text, and they, and it's kind of like, oh, it almost would have been better for you to not bother. Um, and uh, you know, sometimes you you get that where it's like not done thoroughly enough, or worse, like something actually gets done poorly. I don't know if you can see that, but. Um, uh, this probably would have been worth finding someone who knows how to paint. Um, so, uh, so that's that's no good. When people are spread too thin, like I, I'm a huge fan of the sleeping at night and leaving the office and going home, maybe like putting together a little salad and stuff. You know, like uh, having a little bit of work-life balance. So if um, if your thing is like, well, I'll, I'll just put in a full day of code and then I'll do all the other things for my project that I feel like ought to be done. Uh, fast forward a couple of months, you're going to kind of hate that project. So um, let's talk about why I'm giving this talk. So I, I do do a little bit of coding, um, but I mostly uh, am an organizer of people. So uh, before I came to the free software movement, uh, I was a non-coder organizing other non-coders, like getting people to come to, uh, you know, write letters or go down to the state house or sometimes stuff envelopes, although almost no one does that anymore. Um, and so, you know, a lot of the things that I learned there about what makes volunteers want to keep coming back to do something for you, um, I thought, well, it would be nice if I could then kind of share that out with uh, with the free software community. So. I got a job at the FSF, and then I spent a couple of years as a non-coder working to organize coders and trying to figure out, like, well, hey, well, do you want to come and do this FSF booth? Like, we just had a new license, or the new version of Emacs came out, and people want to hear about it. And so, um, so we learned a lot about how to get folks to come in and communicate a little bit better about the things that excite them about the code they're working on. So that was fun. Um, then, you know, we kind of went around back the other way where um, coders were like, yeah, I would like to, um, I would as a coder like to learn how to get more coders. And uh, so that's like when I learned to code and then I learned that you could teach other people to code. Um, I, we also started talking about like how do we get a more diverse free software movement? How do we bring in more women? How do we bring in just more people generally? And so, um, so then we're, we're at like coders recruiting more coders. So this is sort of like where we close the circle. And um, we're going to try and get it so that you, for your code project, can learn how to get non-coders in. So we've gone all the way back around again. Uh, and I, I think this is a really important thing because, um, you know, there's, there's, there is a finite number of coders in the world. We could, I suppose, try and teach everyone to code. Um, which kind of makes me tired just thinking about it. Or we could embrace the fact that the free software movement probably needs some non-coders. So that's why I think we should close the circle. That's gonna that's gonna get us over the hump towards the, you know, maybe maybe not like the same percentage of the desktop uh, market as like a Windows, but maybe above like the you use what on your computer. So um, you know, it's so. Steps at a time. We're, we're not gonna we're not gonna get it all at once. But um, so I I believe that free software needs all kinds of people. Uh, you see projects where it's like, oh, we could really use more documentation or translation, or someone to put our event together somewhere that's not you know like three hours out of town in a basement, you know, and stuff like that. So it's like 
all of those things are going to help the free software movement. So, so that's kind of the why, right? And uh, now we're going to talk about the how. So, so we've established that we need people. How do we get them? Uh, and at first, you might be like, "Huh? Well, we could use help with like all the things." Or maybe your project kind of looks like this, and you're like, "I, I know we need help, but I don't know what we need it on." Um, and uh, so then you're sort of thinking like, well, who knows what you need? Like you, if you're, if you're a coder at a code project, you know about the code you need, but you might not know about the other things that you need. Um, and in fact, you might actually, it might not be, you might not be the right person to sort out what is needed beyond the code base. Um, one of the things that uh, we do at nonprofits is like a, a SWOT analysis. And there's, there's a Wikipedia article on this and stuff. But this is like strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So this is like kind of how you analyze your project to see like, what are we doing awesome at? And what are we really kind of like letting fall on the floor, basically? Um, and you look at it from an internal, external origin. And these work the best when you get lots of people in. You invite your users, you invite like someone who tried your project once, you invite someone from a similar but different project to take a look and really answer honestly what your project excels at and what really could use some improvement. So um, I highly recommend doing this. The more like if you spend some time on it as opposed to be like, huh, oh, well one person mentioned the website's kind of crummy, like maybe we'll start there. I mean that's still better than not fixing the website if you know that it's crummy, but um, but kind of really looking at this, and then you can identify like how bringing non-coders into your project is helpful, and which kinds of folks you need. Because it's people are going to feel a little weird if you bring them in. And you're like, oh, like you're a caterer. Um, I mean, we don't ever have in-person events, but um, maybe you could cater. I don't know, something for us sometimes. So like, you don't want to just always be like, ask every single person you know to help you with whatever they're good at. It's, it's, it's better and more fulfilling for that volunteer if you bring them in on something and you're like, we desperately need X, whatever it is. Um, so in some ways, I think non-coders are the same. They volunteer because they, they want to learn something, they want to meet new people, they want to uh, acquire new skills. They want to maybe put something on their resume that makes them look a little bit more snazzy than their Starbucks job or whatever it is. Um, and then it's, that's like the recent graduate. <laughs> I think, I think uh, Cambridge, we have a ton of schools. I think nearly everyone who works at Starbucks in Cambridge, Massachusetts has a college degree. <laughs> so I, mean, I don't know what it's like in your city, but in my city it's kind of like, I bet you don't want to learn anything else about making coffee. So you can you have this opportunity to help them learn something else and maybe get a job at something besides Starbucks next year. And if you're lucky, they'll bring you all those little pastries to your meetings. Um, so non-coders, they're the same, but they're also different, right? Um, you know, there's a, it, it's not escaped me that there's a certain mindset that goes to the code. Like when I was learning to code, um, doing my homework upstairs and my husband would like, oh, do you want anything to eat? I'm like, oh, I'm busy. And I was like, but it's, you know, and then I was like, oh, wait, that's my husband. I like him. And it's kind of like, oh, the, the context switching irritation is real. Like, it's like you need long, uninterrupted chunks of time to do that. Not necessarily with other tasks. Um, so you can, you know, uh, you can look for people that have slightly less time to offer when you're looking for non-coding volunteers. They might be able to help you in smaller chunks. Um, they also are not going to be super motivated by exactly which scripting language you're using and which NoSQL database you chose. They want to know what does your project accomplish in the real world. That's what's going to be motivating to those folks. Um, so maybe you can, you know, maybe the part that excites you is like, oh, we're building a totally new, like, clone of the Django framework because we had to write our own from scratch and that's, we're jazzed about that. But what you might say to someone else is like, we're trying to build this thing that helps musicians and artists get their work out there. And they're like, yeah, okay, cool, I can get behind that because I didn't understand anything you said about Mongo, so, you know. So, just uh, the way that you talk about your project to someone who's not going to work on the code part is, is a little different. You're kind of going at maybe zoom out a frame or two. Um, everyone with me so far? Okay. 
So, um, so where do you look for these folks? Uh, I'm going to say probably not quite the same place that you found your coding volunteers. Um, unless, of course, it's the GNOME Outreach Program for Women, which has done a really great job of bringing coding and non-coding volunteers and interns into projects. Um, and that's, you know, on that tack, like, I would heartily encourage you to participate in that program if you can. Um, but you can also ask around, like if you know that a project has an awesome website, and Gnome is a pretty good one, you could sort of say like, where'd you get all those great graphics and web design people? Uh, and in fact, uh, you know, they're usually like really willing to tell you because they know, they know all the other folks. And they're like, well, they already built our website, so they're looking for something else. So go ahead and ask like your, your, your project buddies or your next door, you know, next door project in the virtual space, so to speak. Um, so if they're, you know, they're doing something great and you want it at your project, go ahead and ask. That is one of the awesome things about like free and open source software is that like we're kind of all in it together. So people want to help you, um, you know, until you get too close to the enterprise maybe. But <laughs> anyway, so um, internships are a great thing, um, but they're not like a panacea, so to speak. When you see stuff like, like the office or um, the uh, 30 Rock, you see interns and they're, you know, they're taking out the trash, they're cleaning up the bathrooms, and you know, they're stuffing envelopes for like 40 years and uh, emerging, you know, weasoned and sad. Um, those are not interns that you're gonna keep. <laughs> those are not interns that are gonna talk up your project to other people at their school and say like, oh, you know what? I got to stuff envelopes for eight hours a day. It was magical. If you find that person, um, you should probably just slowly back away and let them go on their way. Um, but uh, the, the thing about interns is it's, it's more than just grunt work. And you're investing time and effort into teaching somebody to do something. So if you do ship t-shirts all over the world to your contributors, get a pick and pack system for that. Bring your interns in to do something that actually has some substance and value. Because it's, it's not going to be worth your time to teach someone how to stuff t-shirts in a box and go down to the post office. And that person is not going to grow into being someone who can take on more and more important stuff at your project. In fact, it's going to be like a net negative where they're like, yeah, whatever you do, don't intern there. So you don't want to be that internship provider, right? So. Um, next thing is uh, you want to make your non-coders comfortable. So sometimes, and I know there are, there are projects where it's, you know, that's, that's going to mean different things for different projects. Uh, the first thing I would say is sort of prepare. If you, if you know someone's coming to like meet you and you don't know like where anything is or what you need done or what you think they could help you with, then it's too early. You want to, you know, when you have someone come in and you're like, oh yeah, I thought you could help us with translations. Uh, yeah, I don't know what language is and um, actually I don't have any of the files here and, you know, that's, that's not very motivating. I mean, you don't, you want to do this for any kind of volunteer that's coming into your project. You don't want to be like, uh, I'm sure I can find something for you to do around here. That's, that's not a great thing. Um, Clear is is not like is is gonna is gonna make it a lot easier to move forward. So if people know like I'm here to design the T-shirt, like awesome, okay, and then like you know they have to worry like oh am I why am I here? What am I doing? Is, is someone gonna make me get all the coffee or what? So you can just do a clear is is not from the beginning, and then then point them in the the direction of the is, and they will go at it. Um, you also want to check your lines of communication. Uh, for a lot of projects, we do a lot of things on IRC, and uh, like I know that's the case for us at Media Goblin. Like, so we do pretty like all of our stuff on IRC. Um, if you have a lot of non-coders, or you haven't asked them, like, are you on IRC? <laughs> then they're gonna be always kind of in the dark. It's like, oh, I guess everyone else has like some kind of telepathy, because like every Tuesday afternoon they all seem marched out like with a new set of marching orders and things to do and it's like oh there's a meeting on Tuesday where all the things are happening so if you're making all of your important decisions especially if it involves that per person's workflow in one place then make sure they're on there um, 
and you know, and it might be that you want to you you want to separate it and just be like, oh yeah, we have that meeting, but I'll send you like the you know whatever the bullet points, the to do or the action items, so you can, but you don't have to get on there. So, just the the everyone having secret conversations thing is kind of strange, right? Um, I also think when you're looking at how you reward people or recognize people for work that they've done. Um, I don't know how many people have a project where uh, you've got one of those things that counts how many lines of code each person has written. Does anyone have a project like that where you know exactly how many lines, like for the for your repo? I think, uh, what's it? Yeah, well you could get, but then like if you aggregate them by the, you can kind of look on that part. So, um, yeah, anyway, so if you're only recognizing people by lines of code, which is not, I mean, longer code isn't better code anyway, so it's not really the best thing. But if you're only recognizing and rewarding work that's done in terms of lines of code, and then you've brought people in that are not going to be producing lines of code, then they're going to kind of feel a little like, oh, chop deliver. Like, you don't really care what I'm doing here. Like, especially if, you, if you're a project that takes that stuff from Git and then puts it like on your website, like, you know, coder of the week or whatever. Um, and it's, you know, I've seen ways that that's been done well, and ways it's been done less well so um, so check your lines of communication um, and it's it's gonna it's gonna have some bugs at first anytime you translate or localize your processes and your you know reward systems to a new place it's like sometimes it's gonna be like well, that feels a little weird at first but you know it's it's gonna like anything else it will have bugs so uh, and that's okay but then you want to take a look and see how you can fix them so keeping those folks. Um, I like this one. We say this one, uh, teamwork makes the dream work, which is catchy. Um, but also, like when people feel like they're part of your team, then they're going to work harder. They're just, it's just how it is. Like, you know, they're not going to be like tweeting about my jerk ass boss. And sorry if that makes it not G. Um, and then uh, kind of letting them know what the main goal is, like so that they're not constantly showing up with the wrong work done or the wrong spin or the wrong, you know, materials. Like, oh, like I, I thought I thought that Fosdem was gonna be really fancy, so I wore a suit, and it's like, no, oh, it's not really a suit crowd, you know. So like making sure that they have all of the information that they need so that their work actually fits with your overall goals. So, um, so working towards one goal is, is critical. Having folks feel like they are a part of your team. Uh, if you blog about stuff that's going on in your project and you mention things like, we do this at Media Goblin where we're like, oh, we've got Jessica working on this awesome library and we're really excited about it. But then, you know, we try to also recognize uh, non-code stuff. Uh, we have someone who organizes this like international network of folks to translate for us, which is awesome. So we'll mention that also in a blog post. So. However you like kind of let people know like we're excited about the things you're doing and, and you're part of the team uh, is good. If you have um, you know like conferences for your distribution, I don't know which distributions folks are here from. Like this is the distro room, right? Um, but if you've got if you've got events that you hold for your conf you know for your distro, then Give your non-coding folks like a place to hang out, or like a couple of, you know, couple of slots to talk about design or uh, to talk about translation, so that they're like kind of in there with everyone else as part of the thing. Um, and we we talked about this. A little recognition can go a long way. Uh, and um, has anyone seen uh, Glenn Glenn Gary Glenn Ross? Yes. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Everyone in the back. So this is this movie about sales where they're like, always be closing. Coffee is for closers. So if uh, so, all of those things, like maybe those specifics, uh, you know, the specific examples they give you are like, yeah, we don't do any of those at my project. Or actually, I feel like we're okay on that. Um, but so maybe just kind of when you're thinking about your non-coding volunteers and how you treat them, uh, always be including. If it's like, oh, we're all going to go out for beers, like. Oh, we should bring we should bring the folks that work on the website. Like, you know, I mean, if they haven't already gone home like four hours earlier, so. But uh, which you know, hey, maybe you should have gone home four hours earlier, or out for beers four hours earlier, right? <laughs> All 
All right, this one is specifically for Joe. This is about listening, but it's also a cat. Because um, you've got to put in a cat slide, right? Um, so uh, in the theme of how do you keep folks, you want to be listening. Um, and, and, and uh, you know, I talked about the context switching. So if you have times when, like, listening's not a great idea, just let them know. Like, hey, so we'll have a meeting on Friday afternoon. When I'm, when I'm done coding for the week, and then I can listen. Um, so, you know, it's, it's okay to schedule the listening. Uh, listening is, is reciprocal. So if you're, you're listening to them, then they will be listening to you. People are pretty unmotivated to listen to someone that they think isn't listening to them. So it's just, it's just how it works. Like all, all of the like kind of, you know, monkey parts of the brain are like, uh, if you're not listening to me, then I'm not listening to you. Um, and so that, that sets up a bad sort of precedent. Uh, what you want to do is be listening all the time. Listening is habit forming, and it's good. Uh, once you've formed that habit of listening, uh, the things that get shared with you will be better, especially if it's, you know, there's some give and take. It's like, oh, oh, you know, like Joe really likes to hear about this stuff, so I'll tell him, I'll give him more updates like this. So you'll get more like the information will become more of the kinds of things that you want to hear and then you'll over time figure out more of the kinds of things you want to tell like the person working on your translations or helping you with documentation. Um, the thing about not listening is uh, you do not want to be known for not doing it because eventually you start getting told, being told nothing. And having no information about what a bunch of people that you've maybe like given the password to monkey around with your website is, it, it could be bad. Then you get like, then you get a note like, uh, you know, somewhere when you're on, at a conference, like in another country, like uh, somebody totally screwed up the website. And I'm like, oh, right. Uh, that's because I haven't responded to those last like 18 emails from the web team or something. So, um, being like a famous non-listener is gonna, that will eventually come around and bite you in the you know what. So, um, another thing, everyone is an expert at something. Uh, and that means that you don't know, um, you don't know how long it takes to do things that are out of your realm or your area. You don't know what the frustrations and pain points are for things that are outside of your area. like. For instance, fundraising is one of those things. Uh, sometimes I encounter folks, and it's like, yeah, yeah. Well, can you just do like some of that magic, like raise the money for us? I'm like, that's like non-trivial work there, actually. <laughs> so it involves a lot of follow-up and a lot of things. Um, and you know, if it's if it's not your realm, then you you kind of want to let the person who is the expert in that realm sell you like. Yeah, uh, grants are going to take us like probably a year or two to come around because that's like a huge slow process. So don't ask me why we aren't getting grants next week or something. Um, and again, we talked about this uh, getting your you know what handed to you when you uh, assume that you're an expert in somebody else's field. Um, and then just to note on this, nothing specific, but um, the pedestal, like I don't know how many people have read the Eric Raymond, like how to ask questions for the almighty coders. Yeah, okay, I see some like, yeah. Hey, it's not the most embarrassing thing about the free software community. Um, but the, the pedestal, I think, is, is not helpful. And not because sadness. Like, so sometimes when I tell people like, oh, you know, like bringing people in, like getting new folks, like, you know, and they're like, well, I don't want to be nice. Just like, if someone's all sad, that's not my problem, blah, blah, blah. Um, and that's not why. That's not why I say that. I mean, I, I am. I am opposed to unnecessary sadness. I just want to make that clear. Um, but because there are other fishes in the sea, so if you, at your, you know, if your project is one that's making uh, folks that work on the website do translations or documentation sad, then they're going to go to another project, maybe Media Goblin, because we're really nice to them. And um, which is okay, but I'm in the spirit of free software. I'm sharing this information with you. Um, so, just to recap, everyone's an expert at something. We all love cats. I mean, listening is important. Um, bonus points for finding out why your non-coders are working on your project because that's going to help you uh, motivate them and give them more things to do so that they can be even more impactful at your at your project. 
Um, not treating people like monkeys because they'll leave. And um, there we go. We have some picture credits. And uh, just to kind of end, like a, a lot of projects I see monochromatic, like almost all coders and nobody else. And um, you know, it's. I think that that is not that's not the way that the free software movement is going to grow and dominate the world. And I would like to see the free software movement grow and dominate the world. So I want you guys to all help me grow all the plants. Okay? Thank you. All right. So I would be happy to take questions if people have them. Yeah. Oh, uh, oh, did you find, okay. Oh, Joe's gonna run around with the microphone. And then I have one, we have another question down in the second row, just so you can run all the way up and all the way down. Okay. All right, uh, I'm in a, actually in a project where uh, the problem is that we have two little coders. Uh, mm. So I wanted to know if the same applies actually to uh, attracting more coders or? Uh, some of it definitely does. Uh, not treating people like monkeys and, um, you know, inviting them out for lunch when the whole rest of the project's going out for lunch. So a lot of that inclusion stuff definitely works for, that's, that's like a human being thing. Um, so, it's a, you know, we're talking about non-coders who also happen to be human beings. So, yeah, a lot of that applies, um, definitely. We have the next question. Maybe a stupid question, but are you the people who design the awesome logos that all the open source software has? Because I really love all the logos. <laughs> yeah, so designers do make logos. Um, yeah, I, uh, and, there, and, there, and, and like I said, like not, it's not discreet. Like, so some stuff, like if you look at the Fedora stuff, that's usually designed by Mo Duffy or someone else on her team that doesn't do code and just works on design. If you look at Media Goblin, we happen to be lucky where we have a designer slash coder that, but that doesn't want to do any of the blogging. So, um, you know, it's 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 a little different in each project. But um, if you want an awesome logo, um, people who work on design is a great place to look. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Um, you mentioned briefly recognition. So. I, I mentioned briefly. I'm sorry. You moved to the right away at the for the keyword. Recognition. Recognition. Yes. So. Um, I'm curious if you or anybody else in the audience, um, sure. you know, would give some ideas on, on best ways to recognize contributors. Like, t-shirts are great, but sure. I think they only go so far. Yeah. Um, so sometimes I think just saying thank you is wonderful recognition. But yeah. you know, I'd, I'd love to hear other people's thoughts on that. Yeah. Uh, I'm a tech writer for SoundCloud, and the engineers whom I work with are very happy to be working with me. And one of the best things that I hear is, thank you, that's really, really helpful, or I learned a lot from what you told me today, or, or when, we're, when I'm pairing with somebody, they, they tell me exactly what I've done with for them. And the other comment that I have is that um, there are highly skilled people around that they, they don't necessarily work at Starbucks. I would probably even target people who have full-time jobs. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, that was just for fun. But uh, your point about uh, not actually, not only saying thank you, but saying thank you sort of verbose mode, right? Like, like when someone's done like six hours or 60 hours of work for you and you're like, huh, thanks. Like, ooh, that's, that's not the greatest. If you can be much more thorough, like you were describing your work situation, which sounds great. Um, like, thanks, I know that was probably a lot of work and we haven't touched it for a long time and I really appreciate you untangling that mess or, you know, yeah. Uh, I just wanted to add on the recognition side, there was a talk in earlier about Fed Message, and one of the things it's used for is uh, Fedora's badge system, which is just some some people like them, some people don't, but the leaderboards where basically like there are many things you do in Fedora, uh, you edit a wiki page, for example, and it automatically tallies that, and if you're in the, if you're in the fast system, uh, it will automatically grant you badges, so like you've edited a hundred wiki pages, you get a badge for that kind of thing, so that's another way to recognize people if your project has uh, the infrastructure to do that sort of thing. Yeah, and uh, I would say like it, even uh, along with the badges, like giving someone a title. So um, putting like intern on your resume is not as awesome as graphics design associate or something. So let, and you can ask them like, what, 
uh, pick out an awesome title for yourself, you know, because maybe you don't know what it is. Maybe I'll, um, put up some more explicit um, job offers, health wanted signs in, mm -hmm. in your project, whatever it is you're making. Mm -hmm. Make sure that if you start it up, hey, you want to help, we need this. Or A lot of people don't know they eat that it's even possible to contribute. Yeah, and uh, I think the, the FSF has been doing a better job of this uh, over the last few years where they have um, written uh, their volunteer opportunities up as more of like a job description because they, they want people to like kind of help with the licensing queue, but they're sort of like, hey, are you interested in licensing and learning about free software licenses, et cetera? So I think, yeah, treating it like a, a job description is awesome. Look at your users as a private source of people. Yeah. They're already convinced it's a useful program, project. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Over here. Wouldn't it be a good idea? To Hold on. Oh, sorry. Remember that mic thing we were doing? Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay. Any advice of getting rid, rid of the pedestrian? Uh, oh, um, hmm. <laughs> it kind of depends on the person. So that, I put that out there, like, sort of, like, to plant the seed. Um, but so it sort of depends on the project, like, and, and who we're talking about. So if you suspect you yourself are on the pedestal, um, then, then we can we can work with that and kind of thinking about uh, you know ways to like not not putting things in your docs where it's like don't bother the sysadmins ever or things like that. But um, I think also genuinely asking other people about their work because uh, I know when you have a mixed environment of coders and non coders, the conversation can tend to get like super code heavy and and no one's ever like hey what's coming what's happening with the logo project like are we getting new t-shirts soon or something. So I think asking about the other people's work is, is a really key way. Uh, if you have someone in your office that's really pedestally and you want to fix that person, that's a little bit more difficult. Um, I guess you have to decide on an over under whether that person is worth having, because if they're like really staticky for you. So, and there's, uh, yeah, I can take it. Hold on. Oh, and then, okay. Oh, you're, <laughs> I'm sorry, one behind. Okay, great. So, uh, is there a central place where people who would like to contribute, uh, where they can find uh, a central place from different projects uh, to find uh, a volunteer job, actually? Yeah, not sure. as such right now. I would say that um, one place that you could post if you have things is idealist.org, which is a that uh, tends to it's like nonprofit job listings, but there are also volunteer opportunities in another section of the site. So if you had stuff and you're like, I we don't have any schools, I don't know any people that don't code, I have no idea where to start. Um, maybe try posting on idealist.org in your area. Wasn't there an open source project trying to do that? <laughs> For, oh, aggregating all of the yeah. uh, non-code volunteers? It would yeah, be Yeah, open hatch. Open hatch. Well, no, we we're actually working on getting people coding volunteers. I would totally pimp open oh. hatch if, I, if it was time to do that, but. Okay. <laughs> I thought it was all contributions, there's just coding. Oh, uh, well, so open hatch has the, we have two different activities. One is where we do open source comes to campus and we talk about like all of the different things, but those are local and specific in place. Uh, and then on the website is an aggregator of bite-sized bugs for newbie programmers or people who are new to the project. Uh, so the the on the internet uh, opportunity is uh, is code specific, and then the local events are code and non-code. So uh, if you if you live somewhere with a school that you think would be a great candidate for an open source comes to campus event and you want to partner and maybe like siphon off some of those newly energized volunteers, let me know. So, uh, so one thing that you can do to uh, help uh, people who are uh, not necessarily coders, or actually even coders too, but you should recognize that uh, different people have different interests in a project. Mm -hmm. And when you're having meetings, you should try to prioritize it so that um, you have 
the topics that everybody needs to hear, mm -hmm. and you try to make it that if you have to delve into details, uh, make that either uh, later in the call and optional for the people who really want to listen to that. Yeah. Um, like, for instance, I'm a designer, and uh, sometimes uh, I'm in phone calls where people just talk constantly about like the code and the details of the implementation and all of this mm -hmm. before they actually get to my part. So I'm wasting, you know, uh, most of an hour just yeah. waiting to get to the part where sometimes they're like, oh, well, we ran over and sorry, we can't talk about it, you know, right at the end. Instead, they should prioritize, you know, try to make it so that it's useful for everybody's time. And yeah. it's like, okay, well, we, we have a special, you know, uh, person on the phone on this call. Let's try to address the needs of this person. Yeah. Um, so that's one way to try to, um, you know, appreciate people. And yeah. appreciate people. Totally. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a, that's an excellent point. Um, I could probably do a whole other talk on um, how to make meetings not suck, but that but that'd be excellent. But uh, yeah, uh, but uh, yeah, timing and uh, and getting to the parts and making sure that everyone there is going to participate or has been told they don't have to call is a pretty key piece. So. And just one little tiny thing um, that when you're out, like um, you know, maybe hanging out, getting a, a coffee or a beer or something, you know, sometimes just buying a beer or coffee or other beverage of choice for somebody is like a really nice way to say thank you. It's it's not that much, and people, you know, will buy each other ones and all of this, but it's a nice little tangible thing. Awesome. All right. So buy people coffees and beers. I think that's that's an, another fantastic point. Or waffles. All right. Uh, we have time for one more question, and he's close, so he gets it. <laughs> just, a, just a quick, just a quick follow in there. Uh, I think giving contributors something that that you can't buy. So mm -hmm. if you just give them a piece of swag, it could be a thirty-five, you know, dollar T-shirt or you know, um, sweatshirt or something like that, and that's nice, and they can wear it with pride. But if you give them something that you can't buy on the website, then that's uh, something that they can wear with a lot more pride because they might be at Fosdem or elsewhere and and have that mm -hmm. um, that people might recognize. Oh, yeah, you know. Like, oh, you have the contributor yeah. shirt. Yeah. Like, yeah, I think that's an awesome point too. All right, thanks so much, you guys. Thank you, Deb.